My name is Dariusz Dudek. We are together with Sonia Petronia from Italy and Nick West from UK, so well-known cardiologist. Today, topic uh, for us is stent or scaffold for patients with coronary artery disease. Yesterday, uh, we realized that we are more than 10 years with this uh, technology, bioresorbable stents, and I presented a case with 11 years follow-up uh, of the patient who was treated successfully with this technology and I presented the OCT and ultrasound pictures showing that there is nothing in the vessel wall. So it means we have the golden tube, we have the restoration therapy, and patient is fine, no need for any new revascularization, no bypass surgery, no new metallic stents, no new scaffolds. So my question to Nick is where, where we are now in 2017? What do you think about the patient selection, especially patients with acute coronary syndromes and bifurcation lesions? Thanks, Darius. I think this is the key to where we are in 2017. We have a device. Cases like yours show the potential benefits and utility, but what we're struggling with is choosing where to use it appropriately. So two of the cases we saw, one was an ACS case and one was a bifurcation. I think that, broadly speaking, ACS is a very attractive area, especially in younger people who will have often a limited extent of disease. The concept of almost producing a sticking plaster, a band-aid, if you will, in the coronary to fix the problem and then leave nothing for the longer term and allow secondary preventative medications to treat the rest is a very attractive concept. The issue, of course, is that we don't have a lot of data at the moment and obviously with recent uh, changes in uh, availability of BVS in Europe, this remains only a subject for, for trials. I think the other area you mentioned is bifurcations. Bifurcations is quite a complex area. There are various factors especially when using BVS in bifurcations that make it technically more challenging. And I think that there was broad consensus amongst the group that certainly for complex bifurcations, where there is even a reasonable chance of a two-stent procedure, we should not be using BRS at the present time until we get either a second generation, more data, or improved techniques. Okay, so even if we have the best in class, the metallic drug looting stand, so do you think that we need BRS technology for some patients, as you mentioned? I think there are undoubtedly benefits. Um, a lot of them are emotive. We feel we don't want to leave anything behind. Of course, many of the trials have not reached the time point yet where the devices will be fully reabsorbed beyond three years. And so hunting for a signal of equipoise or even superiority, we may need to wait for two, three, four years. But certainly, for example, the cases that you've shown, we have cases anecdotally as well that are beyond three years that have done very well, but this remains anecdote and needs to be backed up by trial data. Okay, so Sonia, what is your perspective? So looking for more specific lesions like long lesions, CTO, well-presented cases with a lot of scaffolds implanted yesterday. Well, uh, uh, the two cases that were presented yesterday, long lesions and uh, CTO, they were two very interesting cases. I would say that if we think at the metal, full metal jacket, if that is the patient, if it's young, that we would like to avoid. So long lesion, it is really an appealing uh, uh, segment of patient that we would like to treat. And uh, you have to treat those patients with some skills and with like, expertise, on, especially on the technique. And you have to avoid, now we know, small vessels, for example, small vessels that have been shown to be a risk for the outcome of the patient. CTO, it is a little bit more challenging, more difficult, and I would say that there is less in literature to show that. Yesterday has been proven that if you are very good interventional cardiology, then you might do that, but the sub segments are challenging. We don't know how much we are going to be able to seal, what other size we have to choose, so there are a little bit of question mark on this set. So it was clear yesterday that we have the benefits, uh, all those OCT, more than a few years uh, uh, follow-up, so beautiful pictures of the vessel. But we are aware from the literature and scientific data there are some safety concerns. So where are the uh, areas to improve the technique? How can we improve the technique to providing the better safety? I think this is where we're at at the moment. It's all about improving the outcome, and it's generally a safety outcome, as you, as you point out, the issue of scaffold thrombosis. Clearly, we can't change the scaffolds. There are further scaffold iterations in development. The options we have 
are to change the implant technique and change antiplatelet therapy, which I think we'll speak about in a moment. Implant technique is absolutely critical, and as Sonia has said, the results from experienced cardiologists who are prepared to pay attention, put the effort in during the procedure, prepare the vessel, size it with or without imaging, and ensure an optimal result with post dilatation. These are the patients that do very well. I think that if we look at various of the, of the study data, there are, imp, there are signals now coming through that either physicians with low levels of experience or indeed patients with incomplete implants by this current recipe of PSP, preparation, sizing and post dilatation, those are the patients that don't do so well. The UK registry showed that scaffold thrombosis was much commoner for centres that had put in less than 20 scaffolds. And we know from the retrospective analyses that Abbott have performed and Salvatore Brugaletta is in the process of publishing that shows that retrospectively, PSP appears to be associated with a lower frequency of events. Of course, that will need to be tested prospectively. So let's explain this PSP. What does it mean, PSP? Well, PSP is just an, it's an acronym. And it's just to help cardiologists remember that the three key steps and there are many steps to getting an excellent result, but the most straightforward way is number one, to prepare the vessel, ideally with a non-compliant balloon to ensure full expansion of the lesion and negation of the compliance of the lesion. The S is for sizing. Sonia's already mentioned, we need to avoid the small vessels. 2.5 millimeter vessels, and, uh, small, small than 2.5 millimeter vessels should not be implanted. And in fact, the IFU since the FDA approval has said if you believe the vessel is 2.75 or less, we should really use imaging to ensure it's not below 2.5 because of the adverse outcome seen, especially in absorbed three. So sizing is, a, is, is a very important and sizing the scaffold to the vessel size. And finally, after implantation, we know we have to implant slowly to inflate the device slowly because of its different ductile properties compared to the metallic stents. Finally, optimization and for, for the BRS technologies, post dilatation, preferably to high pressure, maybe with an oversized balloon, depending on the relative size of the vessel, post dilatation is absolutely mandatory. Okay, so Sonia, any more practical issues concerning the BRS, BVS implantation and pharmacotherapy? Any recommendation to colleagues in 2017? Well, I would say I would add one P uh, to the PESP, which is patience. When you uh, decide to put a scaffolding, you have to be careful and patient in the procedure. There's no hurry up. But I would say that one important thing, especially for long lesions, uh, is the overlapping of two uh, scaffoldings. You have to be very careful. It was said that we could uh, uh, overlap for one millimeter or even four millimeter. Now we know that we should not really overlap. We would try and put them as uh, um, closer than possible, but without overlapping. Probably that adds uh, a risk uh, more in, uh, in uh, the outcome uh, of the procedure. Uh, what concerns drugs? Uh, well, uh, uh, until the beginning, we have understood that probably uh, the DAP was going to be longer. Now we say that perhaps uh, patients should stay under double antiplatelet therapy for even more than one year, two or three years. I would say that if we treat uh, young patients, they could stay under, under antiplatelet therapy because they don't have a risk uh, concern to that. Of bleeding. But, of bleeding. No, no, but no, 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 uh, at least one year, I think it's mandatory. For some patients, we can even prolong yes, can as even a general recommendation it. in cardiology. Exactly, like we used to do in left main yeah. some years ago. Okay, so thank you for this interesting discussion. So I think that the conclusion is very clear that still with the current metallic technology of drug eluting stents, uh, we, have, uh, we see unmet needs. So very complex lesion, the long stenting is the issue. The results are not perfect, so we need this new technology. We should uh, think about the new generation of bioresorbable stents. However, with the current technology, we should remember about patient, as you said, uh, and uh, good technique, pre-dilatation, sizing, and post-dilatation. And for sure, the optimal pharmacotherapy would help, especially when we are targeting the young people. The prolonged dual antiplatelet therapy could be useful for them as the general prevention of cardiovascular events. Thank you very much for this. Thanks to you.